Hello everyone, my name is John Magyar, Senior Application Engineer with Altium, and I'd like to talk about RigidFlex design. Now RigidFlex is a mature technology that's been around for a couple of decades, and it originated in the military and aerospace industry to meet their requirements for weight, space, and reliability. With today's shrinking form factors and increasing design complexity, RigidFlex is starting to become more common to achieve these complex design requirements. If you're not using RigidFlex, you may be limiting your ability to achieve an optimal space, weight, and reliability requirement. If you're interested in trying RigidFlex for the first time, I'll cover a few basic guidelines here. But as always, speak with your fabricator for more details. First, we'll take a look at cost. Cost for rigid flex design is more than a traditional PCB fabrication. If we put a relative data point um, for traditional PCB, rigid flex can be very expensive, perhaps double or more. But working with your fabricator, you can manage cost by making decisions wisely about the layer stack up and constraints that you follow to ensure success. So that should bring the cost of rigid flex somewhere in the middle, and that's reasonable given the benefits it will offer you. So from a technical perspective, the rigid flex design is all one monolithic outline, you're designing one PCB that consists of multiple rigid sections and flex sections. So it's traditional PCB linked together by flexible PCB. And it's designed as one complete outline. You can verify the outline in the PCB tool using 3D animation. Uh, or at a minimum, you can create paper or mylar models to dial in the mechanics just right. One of the key concerns when designing rigid flex is to think about the bending radius. Where the bending points are, you want to make sure that that bending radius is about 10x the thickness of the, rigid, the flexible section. And now I'll talk about the stack up in general. So we have this one board that consists of rigid and flex. So on the left, I have the stack up applicable for the rigid section. And then going through the middle continuously is the flexible section. So I end up with two stack ups. And the fabricator will use this stack up for all rigid portions and this stack up on the right for all flex sections. And that's how the construction will be the, the flex layers actually cover into the rigid section, so they're combined. And there are many more um, configurations you can use. Uh, this is just a simple four layer example, but for how many layers you have, you always want to try to keep the flexible section symmetrically in the center uh, as a common uh, guideline. Another thing to think about for routing, when we route traces on flexible sections, we want to first make sure that we're running perpendicular to any bending line. Uh, that will ensure that the copper doesn't fatigue and wear out early. Another thing to consider, when we have flexible uh, connectors, use curve traces to get around corners instead of the traditional 45 or 90 degree uh, straight traces that you would normally use on a rigid PCB. So flex, you have to bend the copper with an arc uh, again so that the copper doesn't fatigue. Another consideration for routing is when we have a two layer flex section, you want to uh, stagger your traces so that they don't end up one on top of the other. So here, this lower one, if they're parallel, they're going to be not on top of each other. So again, that ensures that we don't get a, a thickness buildup here where 
uh, copper from one layer is directly on top of another uh, for uh, traces. Um, some other things to take into account would be for uh, vias. So you want to use vias uh, sparingly. Um, using vias in the flexible section, uh, your flexible material is not as stable as the rigid section. Therefore, um, minimizing use of vias is advised. For a hole size within a flex section, you probably don't want to use anything less than 10. And then for the overall diameter, uh, you want to add uh, 10 to that so that you have a nice wide um, via for anchoring it to the polyimid surface. Uh, this ensures that the via doesn't peel uh, or fatigue during uh, repeated flexing. Another consideration is that when we route traces uh, to the via, that we use teardrops. Teardrops expand the copper so that we end up with a more structural connection to the via itself. You're reinforcing uh, that copper area, again, to minimize uh, fatigue and, and potential um, cracking over time. Um, some other things to keep in mind is, would be, um, when placing a via in the rigid section, keep it at a minimum of 50 mils away from the boundary point of the flex. The reason is you can get instability in the materials right at that very edge where there's a transition. So for drilling purposes, keep things back a uh, minimum of 50 mils uh, to ensure good results in the rigid section. Another common question is how to handle power and ground polygons. Power and ground typically require nice wide conductive areas. You want to keep these um, as hatched polygons. Solid polygons will not flex, so it's recommended to use hatch. If you must use solid traces, you have to minimize their width and make sure that it's not a problem for bending. So these are just some of the basics to get started, but using rigid flex will help you achieve the space, weight, and reliability requirements for today's more complex products. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the box below, and thanks for watching.